A uh, quick roadmap of what I'm going to discuss. First off, uh, I'll try to keep it brief, the success of the Humane Society. Uh, some of the fundraising efforts that they use and how they are successful. Uh, some of the nuts and bolts of how they spend their money. Uh, what are the ramifications for animal agriculture? And how can we fight these efforts? And I cringe to use Humane Society and success in the same sentence. But the HSUS is a successful organization. Mr. Pasali has built this up to an organization of 11 million people. To put that into the pers in perspective, the NRA has 4 million members. Uh, it draws a lot of uh, donations and carries a lot of political clout. Even if the membership is not aware and not in full agreement on all the organization's issues, they've also been successful as having a moderate message uh, that appeals to the general public, unlike a lot of the other animal rights organizations organizations such as uh, PETA and the Animal Liberation Front. Uh, HSUS has benefited strongly from a substantial disconnect between the general population and the agricultural community. There are fewer and fewer people who have ties, uh, who have ties or connections or understanding of what modern agriculture is. This means that people's idea of what agriculture is is informed through pop culture. While this, while this presents an underutilized opportunity for farmers and ranchers, it also presents an equal opportunity for animal rights organizations to help the public define how they perceive modern agriculture. HSUS is also capable of drawing motivated activists. They had 25,000 uh, donors for the Yes to Prop 2 uh, campaign. A lot of those came from outside of the state of California. Where in the in the area where HSUS has uh, decided to decided to target agriculture, uh, one of the most uh, one of their their newer ways, and where I, I suspect some growth, as the previous speakers mentioned, will be in the area of environmental, uh, be in the area of the environment, and especially litigation, uh, use of private nuisance litigation. Uh, which is on its face intended to protect uh, property owners, helps to serve the HSUS's underlying goal of uh, damaging animal agriculture. Also, uh, they've funded various uh, environmental research studies conducted by organizations that are guaranteed to deliver, to deliver results that are favorable to their side of the argument. They've gone through the administrative agencies, uh, whistleblower, whistleblower su suits in the USDA, such as the Westland Hallmark uh, beef case, which is an issue where they gather the evidence and then held on to and use it for maximum publicity before turning it over to, turning it over to the USDA. Also, uh, an, an effort that they've uh, undertaken is shareholder activ activism. This involves buying a stake in a company to gain access to board meetings to where you can influence the company's policies and uh, use that to damage animal agriculture. Now, part of a, another way that the HSUS has been successful, and I know a lot of this is an overview of what you've already heard today, but is attacking, is, is attacking agriculture on public perception. The use of undercover video has, has been very damaging to agriculture industry, even though it's a lot of it, as we've heard, has been uh, highly edited and uh, intended to draw, in, intended to elicit a very strong response. Also, celebrity endorsements, and these aren't just from the usual Hollywood suspects, but also people that you wouldn't expect, like uh, Rush Limbaugh or one of my personal heroes, Willie Nelson. Uh, also, the HSUS has, has made a lot of wins. Uh, in kind of the, the low-hanging fruit category, uh, the, the horse slaughter ban, uh, dog fighting and, and cock fighting. This helps give the organizations credibility. What they do with the credibility, though, is where, is where it can be damaging to us. HSUS has not been very successful on a legislative front, and so they have taken to the ballot box. There are currently 24 states that allow some form of uh, ballot initiative. Uh, you can see there with the check marks, I have Florida, which uh, they started with in 2002, Arizona, 
And then I don't need to repeat what happened in California in 2008. Now last year it looked like the animal industry had made a good move by passing the Ohio uh, Livestock Care Standards Board. Uh, but as you can see, I have a bullseye on there. HSUS has its own initiative coming this fall that will basically gut the whole intentions of the Ohio's ballot initiative from last year. So, how is the HSUS able to accomplish all of its goals? Just like anything else, the answer is money, and a lot of it. HSUS has a lot of objectives, has a lot of things going on, and so it needs a tremendous amount of money coming in to fund all this. Their advertising strategy, which differs from other animal rights groups, is focusing on a message that, as they quote, is simple, moderate, and resonates with the average citizen. They aren't out there to shock anyone. They're out there to, they're out there to find common ground. HSUS, HSUS has learned the lessons from some of PETA's mistakes. The moderate message always trumps the shock value at the end of the day. Instead of marching out, uh, celebrities wearing nothing but uh, lettuce or, or, or spraying red paint over fur coats, we have here Mr. Pacelli present a strong and moderate message. And that shows up in the fundraising. Donations to HSUS have remained strong even in a down economy. I'm sorry I don't have more recent figures, but uh, that's the most uh, recent data that we have. But as we can see, they've been able to pull in around $85, $86 million every year for the past several years with a slight lip up in 2005. And uh, we can only presume that they've stayed strong through the down economy. Now most of the funding that they get is not from selling any product or any type of investments that they have. It comes from, it comes from regular donations by average people. Also, uh, they get lots of donations from celebrities. Uh, and then also a lot of people will will a certain amount of money to the HSUS. So, how are they able to maintain these donations when they have such a radical agenda that I wouldn't think uh, if you polled the average HSUS member that they would be 100% on board with? It's a massive and concerted fundraising effort that sticks with their message of, of being seen as moderate, level-headed. We have the uh, commercials with uh, Wendy Malick, a uh, lady from Fraser and Just Shoot Me, a very uh, familiar, comforting face. Uh, also, Sarah McLaughlin. Uh, you may have seen these earlier uh, this year. They're very reminiscent of the Christian Children's Fund uh, commercials that they used to run. Feature footage of animals that are clearly abused. It does have uh, momentary clips of the Westland Hallmark case, but mostly six cats and dogs that are abused. Also, it gets celebrities that aren't very controversial on board with them. Carrie Underwood, Ellen DeGeneres. Uh, I have them up here especially because uh, these entertainers have both signed agreements or have both created deals where uh, various products, Carrie Underwood I believe has a single and then uh, Ellen DeGeneres has a book coming out and a portion of the proceeds uh, from this go to HSUS. Now this in, it, this in and of itself will not raise a lot of money for HSUS but it does lend it even more credibility. And the main goal of all these efforts is to mainstream its agenda. So, given, given what we know of the agenda, or given what we know of how they present themselves to the public, you wonder, how does the HSUS spend its money? Well, here in the graph, I apologize for people in the back that uh, have, have a hard time seeing it. Uh, over there on the right uh, are campaigns and litigation strategic communications, which is advertisements, uh, their salaries, and then fundraising expenses. You'll see most of those are the bars that are a lot taller than the bars on the left. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have uh, expenditures running from about $10 million, or about $5 million to about $10 million. Uh, these are 
actual administration of programs as far as uh, in what I have highlighted in red and the reason I have it highlighted in red is if you view the commercials you uh, get the perception that this money is going towards cats and dogs and uh, of of uh, the HSUS's budget of 125 million dollars 5.4 percent is what they admit goes to cats and dogs And if we dig a little bit deeper, as they have at uh, Humane Watch, we understand that less than one half of one percent goes to hands-on animal shelters. Uh, and by, by HSUS's own admission, in an email to me, uh, in which they were bragging, uh, they care for, or they directly assist 70,000 animals a year. Now, I, I, I I know it's unfair. I, I know that uh, nonprofits uh, do have a significant amount of overhead costs. And I know it's unfair to just judge them on the amount of money spent uh, per animal assisted. But if you look at a budget of $125 million and compare it to the 70,000 70, animals that they claim to care, that works out to roughly $1,800 per animal cared. So, does the public know about this? Uh, un do namely, does the public know that HSUS doesn't operate an animal care facility? And that it doesn't, uh, it's not affiliated with a local humane society? Unfortunately, the answer is no. In a recent study, a third, a third party study commissioned by com uh, the CCF, we found that although a majority of, a majority of the people polled had familiarity with the, with the Humane Society as an organization and as a brand, they had, did not have an understanding as to its association with animal shelters, uh, with the types of animals that it sought to help or to represent, and the relationship as far as funding local animal shelters. So, what is at stake for animal agribusiness? And, uh, I, I don't have evidence of anything from, uh, from Prop 2 as far as the after effects of Prop 2 in California because this doesn't go in, into effect uh, for several years. So I only have the anecdotal evidence from Florida and looking at, uh, looking at the hog population. And uh, Florida was a minor area for hog production uh, in 2002 when the ballot initiative was passed. But as you can see from a graph using USDA data from 2009, Florida is an even more minor area for hog production. Uh, there, there are livelihoods at stake here, not just corporate profitability, which is a lot easier for an organization to attack, but there are, there are people uh, that, that farm, that have their lives invested into these operations. And they don't have the luxury of uh, they don't have the luxury of uh, you know when when HSUS comes into a state or into a community, they can come in throw a significant amount of money at the issue, uh, win their battle, then pop the champagne and move on to the next one. The people that work on these farms have to try to scrape together a living at, based on. Uh, whatever rules of the game HSUS allows them to play by. We also have investments by, by our businesses, by the people in this room. And another thing we have to consider is the efficient use of resources. Uh, these operations become after, if, uh, if our animal production techniques are dictated to us by how the HSUS likes, we end up with less efficient use of resources higher costs, which leads to reduced global competitiveness. We don't, have, we don't see similar organizations popping up in Brazil, in China, or in the Ukraine. But we have organizations here in the United States that try to put in place artificial barriers which reduce the efficiency of, of, the, animal lives, of the livestock animal industry. Some of the future, future activities that we do have to worry about coming up, and some of them were mentioned in uh, Mr. Simpson's uh, presentation. Uh, first off, Ohio, the uh, guidance amendments to the uh, 
Livestock Standards Care Board is coming up, and it's uncertain how that will turn out this fall. Another, uh, another issue is in the courts, uh, the idea of judicial standing for an animal, which uh, basically comes down to, can you be sued by your cow? Uh, this is a, a favorite project by, the, by various animal rights organizations uh, that would allow someone to file a lawsuit uh, on behalf of an animal. As it currently stands, uh, if you want to file a lawsuit, you have to claim a personal injury for yourself based on some aesthetic value that you lost from seeing an animal abused. But uh, if this were to be changed, uh, that could have dramatic effects for the industry. And also, as Mr. Simpson mentioned, the Humane Society in law schools is, uh, is becoming a bigger factor. Uh, Georgetown, just right across the river, Georgetown and George Washington both have, uh, both have animal law clinics that are funded by the HSUS. Uh, as mentioned, Bob Barker gave a significant amount of money to fund law school cl clinic programs. And then we also have environmental groups that are funded, uh, and as the case was mentioned, by, uh, by state, state funding. So while a, lo a lot of these programs are on their face intended to, uh, to go after and prosecute dog fighters and, and cock fighters and d various forms of blatant animal abuse. It also works to achieve the idea of standing uh, for animals, which could have a drastic effect. So, promise I'd end on a happy note. Uh, we do have some encouraging signs. There has been pushback. Uh, a lot of that has come through social media, which I don't, don't think I can uh, give enough credit to. Uh, just a quick story about, about myself and, and with Facebook. About five or six years ago, I got a, a page. I thought it was a little bit, a little bit lame, a little bit silly, but it's a good way to like, keep up with people from college. And then a couple weeks ago, my mother added me on Facebook. <laughs> and uh, this is the same lady who resisted uh, getting a cell phone until the late, late 90s because it just might be a passing trend. And then I don't want to say when she got rid of the bag phone. But I think Facebook is legitimate and it's here to stay. Uh, we've seen uh, pushback or we, we've seen victories with uh, the Yellowtail incident, which I won't detail much more. Also, uh, in, in the wake of the Yellowtail incident, uh, pilot travel centers removed. Uh, they were collecting donations for Humane Society and they've now uh, stopped that. Also, following uh, pretty close on footsteps of the Yellowtail incident, Charity Navigator uh, downgraded the, uh, uh, its charity rating of the Humane Society, and actually PETA now is a higher ranked as far as being an efficient use of resources than the Humane Society. Also, we have different people out there spreading the word. Uh, HumaneWatch.org, I think, is a great uh, website. Uh, don't mean to keep on keep on plugging it, but I think it's a great website if you want to find information. Uh, as David has said in the past, the, the watchdog needs a watchdog, or the dog, cat, the dog watcher needs a watchdog. Sorry if I bumbled that. Uh, also have, I mean, I mean, people can spread the word through letters to, letters to the editor, and also social networking, Facebook, uh, Twitter, blogs, etc. Uh, and that brings us to future tools. I, like I say, I can't emphasize enough the effectiveness that uh, social networking has because this helps us to not only to get away from just the data-based hard approach, the, the science-based approach, it also allows us to pull a play, pull a, steal something from the HSUS uh, playbook and put a soft face on a animal agriculture. Let them see that uh, behind these businesses, or behind these industries, which are very easy to attack on the corporate level, level, there are people, there are farmers and ranchers that make their business and they do care about their animals. Also something that could be pursued in the future is uh, state consumer fraud protection laws. Lots of state have, states have mechanisms in play that uh, ensure that uh, ensure that charities uh, actually have a charitable purpose and are uh, using, their, using their funds wisely and for their stated purpose. 
And also, I think uh, an, an opportunity uh, that hasn't been pursued a lot is uh, uniting with some of the common enemies of HSUS, some of the common targets. Uh, saying goes, uh, my enemy's enemy is my friend. There are uh, lots of local humane societies that feel they're getting the short end of the stick because a lot of there's a limited amount of uh, goodwill money out there to go towards animal organizations. I think a lot of a lot of these local animal shelters feel that their money, money that should be going into their pockets, is instead going towards HSUS's national agenda. Also, hunters and anglers, uh, purebred dog breeders, uh, they kind of suffer the the same stigma or. H HSUS has uh, made good use of the term uh, puppy mill, which is a pejorative term very similar to uh, what we in the industry here would uh, hear as a factory farm, which can be uh, very damning. So I think there's, there's an opportunity there, also some of the targeted breeds uh, by HSUS. So I think there's some common ground that uh, could be utilized. And so I uh, promised I'd make it quick. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. Sorry for the technical difficulties we had early on, and uh, just ask that everybody remember the big picture in this. Uh, HSUS is out, or we have uh, a tough goal of feeding uh, a hungry world that's going, growing hungrier, and we don't have a lot more land to do it on, and uh, we're going to be we're going to be challenged in the upcoming years by an organization that wants to put artificial barriers in place that prevent us from doing that.